Welcome to the Rob Burgess Show. I'm, of course, your host, Rob Burgess. On this, our 101st episode, our guest is Leon Nafok. Leon Nafok is a staff writer at Slate Magazine and host of Slow Burn. He was previously a writer for the Ideas section of the Boston Globe and the New York Observer. He is the author of The Next Next Level, a story of rap, friendship, and almost giving up. And now, on to the show. Hello, it's Leon. Hey, it's Rob. Hey, Rob, how are you? Good, good. Um, hey, sorry I missed your messages. My uh, uh, secretary, Rose, Rosemary, uh, you know, she accidentally hit the button <laughs> and she made a, a terrible mistake. And, it happens, uh, man. Yeah. It happens to the best of us. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, thanks for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. Hey, it's my pleasure. Thanks for, for, uh, for having me. Yeah, I, I uh, really enjoy uh, uh, listening to uh, Slow Burn. It's one of those uh, podcasts you can just binge on, uh, get right into. It's like a novel in that way. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's it's a great listen. And uh, so I just uh, tell people for d- that don't know who you are, go ahead and just introduce yourself, I guess. Sure. Uh, so my name is Leon Nafok. Um, I am 32. I live in Brooklyn. I work for Slate Magazine as a staff writer. Um I uh, came on to the Slate staff about two and a half, three years ago, three and a half years ago. I've lost count, but uh, but I was basically I was a I was a writer for most of that time, um, covering uh, criminal justice issues, and then uh, the Department of Justice more more narrowly, uh, starting with the new administration, um, and then starting in well I can't remember what, starting when, but it, basically about six months ago. Uh, changed over to being a podcaster pretty much full-time to work on uh, Slow Burn. Yeah, um, and uh, I'm really excited that uh, you're doing season two because I'm already ready for it. I wish it was just here, but okay. I, know, <laughs> I know that you're working on it. But um, going back to the beginning of all this, what kind of inspired you podcast-wise? Like, what podcast were you into before you started working on this? And, and do you uh, think of anything as a model for what you're doing? Um, well, I mean, I think my podcast tastes are pretty typical. I have to, I have to admit, I don't think I, I don't think I have any like super obscure favorites that other people have never heard of, but, um, you know, S town obviously is sort of the gold standard right now. Uh, you know, he really told a story with that show that, um, a was best told in the form that it was told in. I mean, it was like a illustration of what a podcast can do and also an illustration of how ambitious a podcast can be uh, and how artful a podcast can be. Um, you know, I, I can't say that I was trying to emulate as town in any way, but it certainly uh, sort of opened my eyes to, 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 to what the form, to what was possible with the form. Um other than that, I mean, you know, I've, I've listened to all the Slate shows, but those are, those are, those are, you know, mostly a different kind of show where you're, where you have a bunch of people sitting in a room mm-hmm. talking and discussing issues of the day. Right. Um, even so, like, uh, the Political Gap Fest is, is, is a show I've listened to for many years. The Cultural Culture Gap Fest is a show I've listened to for many years. Um, John Dickerson's show Whistle Stop was something of an inspiration, at least in so far as, uh, John Dickerson's able to take pretty, small stories uh, and sort of show uh, show something much bigger uh, with them uh, mm-hmm. you know I think I think slow burn worked uh, because it was um, pretty human scale at m- most of the time like we weren't really like going through big chunks of history and montage form for most of the show we were really zeroing in on moments and and and, and uh, relationships and, and individual people's lives and I think um, I think Whistle Stop does that too Mm -hmm. what else I don't want to just plug my employer uh, <laughs> well, I I don't work for your employer, and I listen. You know, I had an hour commute each way between uh, where I worked and where I lived. Uh, you know, for years, and I still kind of do almost. And so, you know, I, all those podcasts you mentioned have been yeah. staples well, I mean, of, of mine I mean, too. Slate, Slate so I think they're just right? yeah. Slate was early, right? Slate 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 got in, on, into podcasts very early, definitely. Um, and so it makes sense that we have a lot of the sort mm-hmm. of standbys. Um, but you know, I mean, I, I love serial. Uh, I love embedded. Uh, mm-hmm. 
don't even listen to embedded this uh, year. Yes, uh, I have. It's great. Is it's the best, right? It's the, it's so the best. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. really love the backstories uh, that they did, like the series of pieces looking back on, on what these people were doing before they became uh, before they became Trump people. Right. Exactly. Yeah, it's been so good. Uh, I yeah. just want to like show it to people. I just want to like listen to this. Listen, <laughs> I heard this. You should hear this. <laughs> like it's, exactly. that's how I feel about podcasts like that. You know what I mean? So, um, have you, did you ever listen to the um, the Gimlet show? Uh, I know there's been a couple seasons of Startup, but there's a, there's one arc in particular um, about Dov Charney trying to start a new company. Mm-mm. Dov Charney, the the founder of American Apparel. No, I haven't heard that. Uh, you should check it out. It's uh, it's really really good. Um, it's kind of similar. It's a whistle stop in a funny way. I mean, even though it's about the present, it takes like a pretty small story, which is like a guy trying to start a company and kind of tells the story of our culture in a way because it looks back at what American Apparel was and uh, uh, why it mattered and, and, and what this individual who is this sort of eccentric and um, sure, certainly um, unconventional boss uh, and in many ways problematic boss uh was able to do with it and, and, and sort of what happens when he is felled by various forces and what happens now that he's trying to um, resurrect himself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and your, uh, your podcast is very, you mentioned S town and that's another very novelistic show. It, it really tells a, a long form story over a, a, a pretty, uh, episodic arc of, of, of podcasts. And, um, you know, I, I think it draws you right in, in the beginning with the Martha Mitchell uh, episode. Uh, and I think that, uh, we should talk about the Martha Mitchell, Mitchell effect, uh, for people that don't know what, cause I didn't know what that is. Um, yeah, me neither. <laughs> Yeah, that that was probably like because like you say these things and like they were common knowledge at the time, but we just we've forgotten them kind of collectively, and you know we don't talk about them anymore. But they were like just well known just then, and everyone who was alive then knew that. Yeah, we just don't um, talk about it anymore. You know, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, I think that 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 aspect of it was quite humbling to me yeah. like, to realize that you know a lot of a lot of what matters to us. A lot of what mattered to people back then, and you know, it wasn't that long ago, 45 years ago, mm-hmm. um, is just going to turn to dust, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. before before everyone even dies. <laughs> um, it's not even, a, you know, the people who were the people who were around when when Martha Mitchell was a huge star. Um, you know, there's some Gallup poll. I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna mangle the numbers now, but some, some Gallup poll taken in I think 1971, um, which is right around when she became like a public figure. Uh, had her being had her had said that basically like seventy plus percent of the population knew who she was, which is an insane percentage. Mm-hmm. Again, the number might be a little bit off, but it, it, I'm pretty sure it was over seventy percent. But you know, so I, I didn't know who she was um, when I started reading about Watergate, and um, my boss uh, at Slate, Jacob Weisberg, was really ast- astonished when I told him about this and, and he couldn't believe that I had never heard of Martha Mitchell. So I think I think she I think she figured into a lot of people's imagination who lived through it. Um, but for whatever reason, yeah, she just wasn't really passed down. I think I think if she had been you know, I think if she'd been in all the president's men, um, hmm. we might we might know who she was. Right. Um, she was in the original script, or she was at least in one version of the script. There was a, there was a moment during fact checking when I was because um, I had a line in the first episode about how Martha Mitchell is this person who was never really canonized, and you know she didn't really appear in all the president's men. Uh, so I went back and I like I, I had watched I had rewatched the movie before before I started watching before I started working on the show. Mm-hmm. But then when I was fact checking, I was I was like I, I should I should like I should triple check this to make sure she didn't even get mentioned. Um, and I googled Martha Mitchell, all the president's men screenplay, uh, and I came up with a bunch of hits for a screenplay that I could you know that was available in PDF form. And there there's a bunch of pages where they talk about Martha Mitchell, mm-hmm. and I freaked out because you know we had a we had an episode to close you know that that night and i was like what where where's where is this coming from i can't believe i missed this um so i like rented the movie again like went to the part of the movie where this would have these scenes would have would have would have appeared and sure enough they weren't there um so it must have been some early version that, that didn't make it on the onto the screen um i don't know if they were filmed or not but but i think if, if if those scenes had survived if those scenes did appear in the movie maybe we would know who she was because that movie really is um you know i think a big percentage of, 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 of what people know. That's what people story. remember. They think they remember the thing, but they just remember that thing. You know? Yeah, yeah. And I, th- I think one, one really encouraging thing that I that I uh, discovered early on 
when I was sort of trying to decide whether to do this or not, it was I watched all the President's Men, and I realized, but then I got to the end of the movie, like, oh, wait, this this this, this just covers the first, like, five months of this story. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, the final scene is just, uh, <laughs> I think, I can't remember if it's one or both of them, but both, you know, one or, one or both the reporters sitting in the newsroom uh, typing while uh, Nixon gets inaugurated for, for a second term, which would have been in January. Um, and... Uh, you know, meanwhile, then, and then there's finally there's like a montage of, of headlines, right? Like a like a typewriter uh, banging out headlines uh, about things that happened after after Nixon's second inaug- inauguration, um, and that's where you get you know the rest of the story. But boy, like when I realized that only five months of the of the of the, of the saga had been um, included in this film, I thought, okay, well maybe there's more here to to, to uncover. Mm-hmm. Definitely, and uh, it's it's even a cinematic trope, kind of. Uh, it's always the person that uh, they're trying to tell people what's really happening, and no one believes them, and they think they're delusional, and <laughs> that's like that's like a that's almost a cinema cinema trope. So you could almost see it being in a in a movie. They, it's almost a shame it didn't make it into it. I agree. I agree. <laughs> it would have been would have been would have been would have been. Uh... Would have been great. I mean, the thing you're referring to, the Marshall Mitchell effect, just so I, I, I could just define it real quick. Yeah. It's basically a psychological term, like a term that psychologists use to uh, describe uh, a situation where someone makes a claim or makes a series of claims that seem that are dismissed out of hand right. as the ravings of a lunatic mm-hmm. uh, or, a, or, or an incoherent person or a person who's, you know, for whatever reason, not thinking straight. Um, maybe they're drunk or maybe they're, you know, they're having some kind of episode. But then it turns out that the things they were saying were true. <laughs> and that's mm-hmm. the Martha Mitchell effect. Yeah. The, reason, the reason it's named after her is that um, Martha Mitchell, um, I, should, I, should, I should have said this earlier, Martha Mitchell was the wife of... Uh, Nixon's first attorney general, uh, John Mitchell, who was very much his um, his sort of right hand man uh, throughout uh, the campaign during you know during which uh, he was elected president and uh, during the first term and uh, during the second campaign uh, when he was reelected, uh, John Mitchell was the was the head of what's known now as what's known now as uh, Creep uh, Committee to reelect the president. <laughs> okay, I've always wondered this. Time out. Did they how how that just Creep the the, the thing is named creep right did they know they were being like we're creep right we're going to creep in like because i was i was like a little on the nose i think i know did they know that that those were the initials i mean they knew those were the initials i mean the truth is if you if you so the full name of the organization was the committee for the re-election of the president everyone called it the committee to re-elect the president um to make it creep you gotta like you gotta include both the r and the e for it to be creep, so it's a little bit of a forced. Uh, what's it called? Not an anal- analogy. Uh, acrostic. Acrostic. Yeah. No. Is that right? Well, I was going to say a backronym because it's a constructed yeah, that's acronym. It. Backronym. That's what I'm looking for. <laughs> yeah. Backronym. It's a bit of a backronym, but but it's it, it is it, it's too good to not use. Right. <laughs> um, but anyway, Martha Mitchell yeah. was the wife of, of the guy who ran Creep. Yes. And uh, she she's the, the subject of our of our first episode because she um, uh, was sort of treated as a person who knew too much about Watergate in the first mm-hmm. days uh, following the, the burglary, um, and was uh, sort of held against her will in a hotel room and was sedated um, mm. by one of Nixon's henchmen. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's just this sort of nutty story that I'd never heard before I started working on the show. And it kind of tells you everything you need to know about how, you know, about the, about the lengths these people were willing to go to to um, uh, try to contain the story. And also it tells you a lot about history. I think it tells you about how much is forgotten and how... Um, how even these most spectacular stories can be sort of swept to the side of our collective consciousness Mm -hmm. um, until someone dusts them off. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I love history. It was always my favorite subject in school. And, um, you know, I think the one of the reasons I've, even though I, I've never delved into Watergate too much, because I'm, I'm 34, so I'm roughly your age. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I didn't live through it necessarily. I'd lived through the subject of your second season, and we'll get to that. <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, I didn't, it wasn't, yeah, I didn't happen in real time for me. But there's just things that happen that, happened for people in real time back then and it feels very real and like this people are always going to know about this right and then it's like no nobody reads that novel anymore nobody knows about that thing anymore exactly um, yep so it's, re- it's kind of depressing it's kind yeah of depressing. <laughs> you, you can win all the prizes you want you can you can you know have all the front page stories you want as a reporter yeah. and 
doesn't matter. Absolutely. <laughs> On that cheery note. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but, but part of the reason I've resisted learning more about Watergate in these times, because, I mean, you can't help but listen to your podcast and draw comparisons to right now. We were talking about Embedded and, you know, the Russia affair and, um, mm-hmm. you know, uh, something crazy happened then, right? And, and we want to, like, be, you know, cognizant of how history happens. That was, that's why people use the language of Watergate to describe what's happening now. Yep. But in a certain way, I don't feel good about that because it turned out okay, right? I mean, like you talk about, like people uh, came across the aisle and, and thought about what's best for America in the end. And, and I just don't feel that same thing right now. And I think it's false comfort to rely too much on that. So I've resisted using that as my framework for understanding what's right now because I think it's false hope. And uh, I think that people have to be cognizant, as you've pointed out very succinctly, especially in the last episode, and you, you also wrote about this, um, you know, a couple ball bounces differently, mm-hmm. things don't turn out the same. You yeah, know, it's just that, very, that, that, very, you know, fortunate for all of us that it didn't turn into, you know, Biff World circa Back to the Future too. <laughs> wait, wait, wait! Can you wait? Can you, can you give me that analogy again? I'm a big Back to the Future. Episode. I wanna, <laughs> oh, uh, I wanna, you know that the future. writer of uh, the the sequel to um, Back to the Future admitted that he based Biff. Ah, uh, yeah, this whatever. old, this old uh, yes. chestnut. I don't, I don't buy it, man. You I don't, don't buy, buy it, it, really? I've, I've looked into this. I don't buy it because why not? Uh, I'm trying to remember what the smoking gun on this was, but, but I remember <laughs> reading something, being like, "Okay, wait, this." this okay, I don't. I, I remember what it was. It's that. It's that. It's that. Trump wasn't that famous uh, when Back to the Future was written. Well, what year did um, uh, Art of the Deal come out, though? Okay, hold on, I can look it up. Art of the Deal, I think, came out. Because yeah. that would have had to have been the thing that, like, eighty-seven. Oh, well, what year was the sequel? Because is obviously it was nineteen eighty what four? Because the first one was nineteen eighty-four, right? No. Yeah, the sequel. So the first one movie was was obviously was about 1985, and it Five, came out right. in 85. And the sequel was written. Let's see. Part two was released on November 22nd, 1989. 1989. I'm saying. So you think you're saying that 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 part two was based on Trump, but not but not Biff as he appears in part one. Yeah, I guess so. I never thought about it that way, but sure, if you're going to put me on the spot, yes, I'll say that. <laughs> okay, I like it. I like it as an explanation. I, I got to tell you, I was disappointed when I when I when I talked myself out of this because I love the idea that. Uh, I, I don't understand why you want to talk yourself out of this. This is a great analogy. I don't want to talk myself out of it, but I did. But now, now you're talking back into it. So I appreciate it. Um, it. It really does line up really beautifully. I mean, once once when you when you look for the the, the, the analogies. Uh, yeah, but the, but but the reason I reference that is, is of course there's a version of the Hill Valley whatever newspaper that's like Nixon elected to fourth term because he's removed yeah. like the tw- the term limits and twenty foot to whatever amendment remain. <laughs> right. 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 Okay. I don't even remember where I was going with that, but you know, <laughs> you were saying you were saying that the ball bounces a little differently. And yes, exactly. You know, right, and we go into the alternate 1984. Um, you know, and I think people don't want to realize that sometimes, and they they you know they they look to Watergate because that's the last that's the craziest last thing that's happened, kind of like this. And, yeah. You know. Anyway. So I think I think I mean I I I definitely understand why people look to Watergate as a source of reassurance because I think it is reassuring like no matter what you think about you know alternate scenarios like it is reassuring to to know that things got really gnarly for for a minute and things worked out like Mm -hmm. it's just nice to know that it's possible that they'll work out you know maybe that's maybe that's a low bar but it's nice to know that things can get so crazy and so precarious you know like things were really on the on the on the precipice mm-hmm. precipice yeah. so, uh, those ones probably precipice. come from the same, from the same uh, route but th- th- things were really like things were really close to being on the edge and um, and, and, it, and it worked out so that, I think there is reason to be reassured by that however uh, I think it goes too far to say well you know um, Watergate took two years and two months and Trump's been in office since January so 
you know, you, you do the math, that means we're about halfway through uh, the story. And you know, yeah, exactly. give, it, give it another year and two months and we'll be out of these woods. That's obviously not true. Mm-hmm. There's no reason to draw that analogy so specific, so narrowly. Um, and uh, that was certainly would be false hope. Um, and I think you do have to be cognizant of all the ways in which the context is different, uh, starting with the fact that Nixon was dealing with uh, two chambers of Congress that were dominated by, Demo- by Democrats. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously that's not the case now. So No, yeah, and absolutely. And I've, I've, I've always thought that was a big difference. And But but there was also liberal Repu- Republicans, though. And there were even not really, like, liberal Republicans. Like, Barry Goldwater in the end turned out to, you know, he would, didn't he go to the White House? And he was like, look, dude. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. But he did it at the very end, you know. And, yeah, at and, the very and, end, sure. But he eventually, you know, he still came he was, around. He was actually end. one of the, I'll give him, I'll give him, I'll give him, a lot of credit. Actually, he was he was one of the one of the early um, you know one of the earliest most prominent uh, Republicans to be mm-hmm. at least privately ringing the alarm on this. He was saying, I think you know when 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 Alexander Butterfield, uh, the Nixon aide who revealed that the Senate Watergate hearings in the summer of seventy three that uh, Nixon had a taping system in the White House, Goldwater was pretty uh, pretty ready to say you know I think even in the press that you know Nixon needs to release these tapes or else. He looks guilty, you know, and we need we need to hear these things in order to, to be reassured of his of his integrity. Um, and, you know, that's going kind of far, you know, considering. Um, mm-hmm. And and indeed, he was he was the one who who came to the White House, I think, and, and kind of sounded the the final death knell, uh, you know, causing causing Nixon to realize that he had to resign. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, there were also partisans. There were a lot of Republican partisans yeah. who who stood by Nixon for. Um, through thick and thin, and mm-hmm. who continued on to great careers. Uh, you know, Ronald Reagan is a great example. Mm-hmm. Like Rick Perlstein writes in his book uh, *Invisible Bridge* about how Reagan was one of the most uh, enthusiastic and, and unequivocal uh, cheerleaders for Nixon um, throughout 1973 and and. and much of seventy four until the bitter end, you know, saying that he that he didn't really believe all this stuff, and you know, there was one point where Nixon, where Reagan uh, was asked about the, I think about the, I'm trying to remember what the context was, but anyway, there was some moment where where Reagan said that the, that the guys who were you know, who had broken into the Watergate and who had been indicted and convicted, they weren't really criminals at heart. And it was the shame that they were being made to suffer because they weren't really criminals at heart. You know, and this is the guy who's supposed to be, you know, conservative, law and order, you know, tough on crime guy. You know, cause, just because these guys are wearing suits, he thinks they're not criminals at heart. So people, people contorted themselves in all kinds of ways to try to defend their guy, um, even though, you know, there were people of integrity who, who uh, called it straight in the, in the end. Yeah, uh, I can't remember which syndicated columnist wrote that uh, thing about the common responses from a Nixon. Yeah, uh, Art, Art Buckwall. Yeah. yeah, that that was pretty classic, and that still holds up so today. Good. You just you just uh, it's a Mad Lib for today, basically. Totally. Just fill in the blanks, you know. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. Try to bring up bring up a. a what about Chappaquiddick? <laughs> yeah, bring up something worse that the other guys did. Exactly. Compare yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, Playbook doesn't change that much. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but I think the Slate Plus aspect to your show is interesting. And uh, you got to talk to Dick Cavett, which is really cool, because uh, I always thought he was a great interviewer. Any uh, archival footage I've seen of him interviewing, like, John Lennon or Muhammad Ali is mm-hmm. just always a joy to watch. He's a pro. He's yeah. still a pro. He's in his eighties, but he's still he's still got it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I got to I got to interview him. Um, I interviewed him for the first episode. Um, but we use a tiny little clip of of him, you know, in the, in the first episode, just at the very end of the of the of the of the uh, of the story, and then we wanted to do something with the rest. And so we had this outlet in, in Slate Plus, as you, as you mentioned, Slate Plus is the subscription service that Slate offers. Mm-hmm. Um, I believe it's like 35 a year, something like that. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, you get a bunch of stuff uh, that, that, that non-subscribers don't get, a lot of extra material. Um, with Slow Burn specifically, you get an episode, uh, a special episode every week that we released. And, you know, they're, they're, they're different than the, than the main episodes that are available on, you know, on podcasting services. Um, they're a little bit less meticulously edited. They're basically, um, 
me talking to a co-host about some of the stuff that we had to leave on the cutting room floor. I share some facts, some thoughts, some you know, some reflections about the episode. Um, it's almost like a DVD extra or something, you know. And and then we we always uh, played a uh, an, you know an extended interview with someone who mm-hmm. who either was on the show for a few seconds and but had more to say, or someone we interviewed specifically for yeah. Play Plus, like uh, John Dean, um, Nixon's White House counsel, mm-hmm. uh, was someone I interviewed specifically for a, a Slate Plus episode. Uh, about the 18 and a half minute gap uh, that Rosemary Woods uh, left allegedly in uh, in one of the White House tapes that you were alluding to earlier. <laughs> yeah, I, I like the inflection in your voice of the allegedly. <laughs> you know, uh, okay. Well, I got to talk about the tapes because uh, I think this is always the thing that gets me about the whole affair is that, like, why did he keep the tapes? He could have just, uh, as I heard it described in a documentary I watched about Watergate once, he could have lit them on fire on the, on the, you know, White House lawn, uh, before the Supreme Court thing came down. And that would have been perfectly illegal, right? Why didn't he just do that? He didn't have to keep these. They were totally incriminating, even without the 18 and a half minutes, you know? I know. I, I wonder this a lot. I, I think he would have gotten away with it if he destroyed them, honestly. Mm -hmm. I think he was scared of the, that of how it would look. Um, I think he thought it would turn people against him, and maybe he was right. You know, maybe it's possible. It's hard to picture this, but maybe public opinion would have turned on him if if he did something that so transparently looked, made him look guilty. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I think I think there is something to that theory because, in fact, when he fired Archibald Cox, the special prosecutor who had been appointed to investigate Watergate. Public opinion did shift dramatically after that, and I think one of the reasons was that people thought he looked guilty, that, that firing a special prosecutor was something only a guilty person would do. Mm-hmm. Um, so maybe burning the tapes would have had the same effect. <laughs> Excuse me. But yeah, um, a lot of smart people, I think, suggested to him that he should burn the tapes. Um, mm-hmm. I think people seriously considered it. I think he seriously considered it. Um, and I think he would have given him a chance to survive, if not uh, guaranteed a survival. What do you think is on that 18 and a half minutes? I don't know. Uh, it's, I don't know. Like, like, okay, I get what you're saying, that they, like, you know, like, well, I mean, this looks really guilty. We probably shouldn't burn everything. Yeah. But something was so bad about that one part that they were like, <laughs> we can't let anybody hear that. I don't care how bad it looks. Just say she tripped or something. <laughs> Just right. say something happened and we'll never do this. You right. Know? Well, so, so what's confusing is that they, that it, let's say they did delete that 18 and a half minute mm-hmm. chunk. Yeah. Because it had something, you know, extremely incriminating on it. How do you explain the fact that they didn't delete a whole bunch of other stuff that was also incriminating, you know, including the what was became known as the smoking gun tape, in which um, Nixon is telling uh, his chief of staff uh, to basically sick the the uh, the, the CIA yeah. onto the FBI and have the CIA tell the FBI to lay off the investigation. Basically, the the, the idea was to use the fact that Howard Hunt, one of the conspirators on the mm-hmm. on the burglary had a connection to the Bay of Pigs mm-hmm. and to say, tell, have the CIA tell the FBI to listen, we don't want to open mm-hmm. up this whole Bay of Pigs thing, Ooh. just mothball this it's going to be better for the country that way now, now, now you're rubbing against my uh, JFK assassination uh, files, hold on okay, man, we'll do for a while if we, if we, go down the hall. <laughs> we don't have to, but this, the, I'll just say that researching this after listening to your podcast dovetailed very nicely with the already a lot of research I've already done, so this was very convenient for me <laughs> Well, did you did you listen to the main Brussels episode, the one about the conspiracy theory? Oh, absolutely! I was there for that. The dune buggies, man! Don't mess with the dune buggies. <laughs> They're out there. Um, the truth is out there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, so so the question is like, if if he was going to if, if he was going to erase the incriminating material, yeah. why didn't he delete all of it? Um, it's possible that whatever was on that tape was just like that much worse. Mm. Maybe there was evidence that he. You know, maybe, 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 because the, cause the, cause the, the timing of the conversation was very suspicious. It was like the first conversation that Nixon had with his chief of staff after the burglary. And it was like, you know, it was, it was, I think the day of, or maybe the two days later. I can't remember the date exactly now, but it was, it was, it, it, it was exactly the time when you would imagine mm-hmm. the two of them discussing things like plans. You know, like maybe they discussed the fact that Nixon had 
was had been party to the planning um, of the break of the break-in, which you know has never been established that, that Nixon knew about it in advance. And I think most people, most historians, would say that we don't we don't we don't have any any proof that he knew in advance. Maybe that's what was on the tape. Who knows? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I also thought it was interesting that they tried to say that what was on the tape said something different when they released the transcripts and people so could funny, just right? listen to it and they could just be like, that's no, that didn't happen. <laughs> so, I know. So, so sloppy. <laughs> so blatant. Yeah, exactly. It's just, uh, but they were just behaving like there was no consequences, right? I mean, it just seems like they were just like, I don't know, try it. Who's, who knows? Try it. Give it a try. <laughs> well, you know, it reminds me of it. Like it reminds me of how I feel like there's this theory of Trump, which I find very, um, convincing, which is that he, it's not that he's a liar, he just says whatever he needs to say in the moment to make the interaction he's having easier, Mm -hmm. and to make it end more smoothly. Mm -hmm. Like, he'll say whatever he needs to say to please the person he's talking to, you know, whether it's a child, you know, who's been, you know, victimized in a gun, gun attack or whatever, you know, he, he, he just, he'll just say whatever he needs to say to get out of that situation and to make the person across the table from him think you know, positively about him. I think with Nixon and his and his aides, maybe the maybe the flaw in their thinking was that they just they just wanted to get through each little battle and didn't have the capacity to see the next one. So when it came time to release those transcripts, they were like, "Well, we can't release these transcripts with all these you know incriminating passages on them." So this looks really uh, bad, guys. <laughs> we yeah, should do something about this. <laughs> Never mind that, like you know the, that they were obviously going to get caught. Yeah. So it wasn't going to be effective. Um, I don't know. That's my that's my only explanation because yeah, it does seem really careless uh, mm-hmm. and. Uh, uh, you know, ineffective as yeah. far as as far as scheming and lying goes. Oh, for sure. Um, but let's talk about the next season of the show because uh, I'm really excited about this. Uh, just say whatever you can. I want to hear it. Yeah, me, I'm excited too. Um, so the next season of the show, uh, which will be starting later this year, um, probably not till. Uh, sometime around August uh, we will be covering the impeachment of Bill Clinton and telling the story of uh, the Monica Lewinsky scandal and uh, describing uh, the roots of that scandal and then how uh, the Whitewater investigation and the Paula Jones lawsuit led to uh, the revel- you know led, led, led to the uh, scenario in which Bill Clinton uh, you know, perjured himself and uh, and uh, was impeached by by the House of Representatives. Mm-hmm. Did you read uh, Monica Lewinsky's uh, essay in Vanity Fair? I did. Yeah. I yeah. What do you think about that? I thought it was great. Uh, it was really well written. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm I'm still I'm at this point I, I haven't actually reached out to her yet because I've we're, we've we've I've barely I've barely done any of the preliminary research so far mm-hmm. because um, we're just sort of wrapping up and wrapping up some loose ends on the first season. But um, I'm sort of, I, 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 I almost want to talk to her first before I even read a word. Um, Cause I feel like her, her perspective on this is going to be the one least fully rendered in the existing literature. Um, like obviously she's, she's, you know, written about it and talked about it in her Ted talk, but um, you know, for the most part, um, this has been a story told about her and not by her. So um, I was glad to read it. I, I was, I was, it was really interesting to sort of hear what it, for me, that, that, geez, that scene where she's just describing running into Ken Starr at the beginning is really, mm-hmm. uh, really crazy. What did you think? Oh, yeah. I, uh, I mean, I, I, of course, referenced her TED Talk. Uh, that was really powerful. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I've, I've, I wrote a column about this back when that TED Talk came out. But, like, she has shown an amazing level of self-restraint in a pretty media-obsessed culture in which I can easily imagine her being a reality TV staple, um, you know, and some kind of exhibitionist. But I feel like she did everyone, including herself, a favor by 
kind of disappearing into the woods as much as she could. And I feel like she kind of has a more of a perspective on it as opposed to people that get in that kind of situation and kind of, you know, they find themselves in the limelight and they can't leave it, you know. So I think she's she's had a little time to reflect. So I think that's been good for everyone, honestly. Um, so I, I appreciate her self-restraint, and I can't imagine what it was like to go for, through all that, that, you know. That yeah, I mean, God, you know, she, she, I was, this was something that I couldn't appreciate as a, I forget how old I was, but, you mm-hmm. know, in, in 1998, I was in, um, was in seventh, eighth grade, and, um, to me, 22 probably sounded like a lot at the time, but mm-hmm. now I'm like, God, she was a kid, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, I, I remember when all that happened, that was, that was the most scandalous stuff I'd ever heard. I was like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> Bill Clinton, you talk. <laughs> he was just, you know, uh, you know. I, I, what do you think about the reexamination of Bill Clinton? That, that's what I, I want to know. Because, like, I think we're questioning him in a way that, you know, people felt reflexively because of the people who were against him, right? It's just the obvious hypocrites like Dennis Hastert, and uh, Newt Gingrich and all these moral majority conservatives who were like cheating on their wives and molesting kids all the while and and wagging their finger at Bill Clinton. Um, and so it's like reflexively you want to you want to tell those people to get lost, but at the mm-hmm. same time, you know you got to clean your own house before you can ask anyone else to clean theirs. And you know what do you think about the with the Me Too movement? I mean you have to reexamine that through that yeah. lens in I a mean, certain I, way. To be honest with you, like I, those questions obviously are occurring to me. And 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 I'm I'm in, I'm planning on finding my way through. <laughs> I don't mean to step on the next season of your podcast or anything. No, not at all. I just these are these are the things I've been thinking about. You know? But I think no, I think I think that's sort of the heart of or the heart of at least part of what we're hoping to achieve with the, with the season. Like I think insofar as there was like a sub- subtext in the first season that asked people to compare what was happening. What, what's happening now with what happened then? Um, I, I feel like the subtext with the second season will be like, "Gosh, can you imagine how differently this would have played out if it happened today?" Mm-hmm. Um, you know, for better or for worse, uh, depending on your perspective. I think the power dynamic between Clinton and Lewinsky would not have been tolerated by most of the people who, or I don't know, I don't want to say most, but I think by a lot, I think a lot, I, 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 my, my suspicion is that a lot of the people who um, defended Clinton and... Gloria Steinem, of course, wrote a famous op-ed about this. Um, right, in right. In defense of him at the time. Right. And that has not aged particularly well. Um, I think I think a lot of people, people will, will find find themselves are, are, are probably finding themselves re- reevaluating their instincts sure. that they had. Um, I, and I, I want to you know I want to be careful to not be too judgmental about that in, in my telling of the story because mm-hmm. I, I don't want to be a scold and say oh you liberals were hypocrites. You know I, I think I think it's understandable that people's people's notions of. Uh, you know what was normal were, were were different back then. People's notions of what was, you know, the the proper kind of expectation to have over of a, of a political leader were different back then. And that's not to say they were right at all, or that we are wrong now to have the expectations we have now. But mm-hmm. I think it does, you know, it's necessary context to to, to kind of consider when you're uh, looking back. And yeah, um, I think I think I think I want to I, I want to understand it more so than. You know, scold the people who who engaged in it, even though it does mm-hmm. it does shock me. You know, frankly, that um, there was so much support for him uh, in a way that I just don't think he would have today if if, if, if all this was happening in, in 2018. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, if you want to go back to JFK, you know, had he lived a little longer, who knows what kind of scandals he would have been embroiled in with his reckless behavior. So, yeah. you know, you, you think back to all the times in history, what, what if, you know, that's, you know. Uh, but um, anyway, well, um, thanks for being on the podcast for so long. Um, I, I don't want to take up uh, your entire night here. Oh, it was my pleasure. But, um, Talk to you. Yeah. So uh, what music have you been listening to lately? Well, music um you warned me that this question was coming so i mostly listen to rap um i uh i sort of have like a or i guess have is probably the wrong word but have had in the past a sort of side career of writing about rap um and uh top five mcs go uh, i don't want to play that game but you can't <laughs> <laughs> my rap my rap my rap tastes are, are very uh 
biased towards the present, unfortunately, uh, and uh, I have a I have a probably too embarrassing. Uh, <laughs> sense of, sense this of isn't. There, there's no wrong answers. This is just. You know, <laughs> this is a friendly conversation. You know, oh, I, no, I know no, a no. lot of people in in these things are like, "What? You can't do that." <laughs> so I'll tell you. I'll tell you how I listen. How I listen to music. Okay. And uh, basically, like I, I have playlists on my Apple Music. Okay. Um, that I that I um, update periodically. They have. Um, they're basically labeled by by the season. So like right now I'm working. I have fall, winter, 2017, mm. and I just add songs to that as I hear songs that I like, um, and that way like I can go back to old playlists and be like, oh yeah, that was when I was listening to this, or this was like, that was when I was listening to that. Um, so let's see. The most recent stuff on that I've added to this fall, winter, 2017 uh, list are songs from the latest Migos album, Culture Two. Um, that was one of the, they were one of the one of the groups I wrote about when I was writing about rap. I wrote a cover story for the Fader about Migos. Um, a song called "Look Alive" by Drake and Block Boy. Uh, a song called "Best of Me" by Lil Baby, who's an Atlanta rapper um, signed to the same label that Migos is signed to. Um, a bunch of Kodak Black songs. Um, let's see. Couple songs by Smokey Margiela, who's a young New York guy that is, I think, apparently on ASAP Rocky's label. I don't know, man. I just listen to whatever's whatever's new, <laughs> uh, and I try to find the new stuff that speaks to me. Um, a lot of the new stuff doesn't speak to me, but like for instance, yeah, there's like there's there's music that children like that I try to like and can't because it just doesn't make sense to me. Um, but that's what's supposed to happen. You know, that's that happens. supposed to happen. That's pretty much what's supposed to happen. I think, I think if you ask my wife, a lot of the music I just listed off for you is probably in that category. <laughs> but, I, but I find a way. I find a way to, to See, I'm, I'm, feeling like su- I'm feeling man. like super old right now here in that list, and, and your your wife must feel somewhere old. You know? Well, if you saw my gray hair, uh, you would feel so bad. I think I, I'm the one who should feel bad. Uh, but, uh, but it is, you know, I, I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm telling the truth. I, yeah, that's what. That's all I ask, man. It's not, <laughs> you're not going to get a letter grade. It's, it's okay. <laughs> well, cool, man. Well, hey, I really enjoy your podcast, and uh, I think you do a great job. Everyone should listen to it. Um, you know, I, I think it, it really delves into the places that, you know, like we talked about, that people don't remember that they, they should. Um, and, you know, I'm excited for season two. And, Thank you. Uh, yeah, I hope I'll be looking I hope you like it, and uh, yeah, we're definitely excited to make it. So awesome! Well, we'll see uh, how much my uh, we'll see how much my, my my thoughts that I just shared with you will have changed by the time we're done. We'll be <laughs> to listen to this back uh, in a couple months. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, uh, hey, you're welcome back anytime to to expand on anything. So. Cool. Thank cool. you. Thanks a lot. Have a good All day. Right. You too. Bye bye.
If you enjoy this podcast, there are several ways to support it. Join the Rob Burgess Show mailing list. Go to tinyletter.com forward slash the Rob Burgess Show and type in your email address. Then respond to the automatic message. I have a Patreon account, which can be found at patreon.com forward slash Rob Burgess Show Patreon. I hope you'll consider supporting in any amount. Also, please make sure to comment, follow, like, subscribe, share, rate, and review everywhere the podcast is available, including iTunes, YouTube, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play Music, Facebook, Twitter, Internet Archive, TuneIn, and RSS. The official website for the podcast is www.therobburgessshow.com. You can find out more about me by visiting my website, www.thisburgess.com. And if you have something to say, record a voice memo on your smartphone and send it to the Rob Burgess Show at gmail.com. Include voice memo in the subject line of the email. Until next time.